Here I am, I'll be speaker at the moment, uh, welcoming you to the Zoom. All the meetings this year, is, during which I've been, have been Zoom meetings. At the end, even if, after we close the formal part, there'll be an opportunity to uh, chat for a few minutes after that. And I invite now Sam to introduce our speaker. Going to make this brief. I've known Sam Danaway since I first came to Hawaii in 1987. At that time, he was just leaving the Navy as the fire protection engineer and starting his own firm. And he went for a number of years as, as the only employee of Sam Danaway Fire Protection Engineers. And just, he ran that, that firm for, I think, about 30 years, Sam. And you yep. just recently joined Kaufman Engineer with your, with your other engineers and Sam Danaway. Sam has given this presentation at least once to EEH, probably about 15 or maybe even 20 years ago. And 1998. I, I'm forward, 1998, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to stop there and uh, we can proceed. Sam. Again, that's Sam Gilly, and this is the other Sam, Sam Danaway from Kaufman Engineers. Today I'm going to make a presentation on the uh, second great. Honolulu Chinatown fire, and, and thank you, uh, engineers and architects of Hawaii, uh, founded in 1902 for, for inviting me to do this on, on your platform. Uh, I, I, it's, uh, I always enjoy giving presentations to, to you all, and, and, and uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you get some enjoyment out of this one. Uh, okay, if there are any architects in the audience, uh, contact me later, and we, we might be able to set up uh, an hour of HSW uh, learning unit time for you on uh, for this program because we have got approval for that. I want to talk about my technical resources really quick because I probably won't have time to do it at the end, but most of the photographs you're going to see came from the Hawaii State Archives uh, and likely to them through the Honolulu Fire Department. Uh, other major resources were uh, the two newspapers, Pacific Commercial Advertiser and Hawaiian Star, and special consideration to Paul Fox, who basically brought to me all these photos. And in fact, he told me a story how uh, way back when, when he was doing some work for the Honolulu Fire Department, he found a bunch of uh, glass photographic negatives in a drawer and uh, a lot of these photographs that you're seeing today were basically from him uh, taking scans directly from these glass uh, negatives, which, and, so, and Paul's just been a great resource uh, for fire safety, fire safety education material over the years. Okay, with second great Chinatown fire, it, it is the second fire uh, that was great. And we'll talk a little bit about the first one uh, if I get time at the end. Uh, again, it's, it's an interesting story. Uh, it's got some intrigue. Of course, we have, uh, you know, something near and dear to our hearts, a dangerous pandemic going on and uh, issues of, you know, racial and ethnic conflict, very large fire heroic actions of the fire department, and of course, uh, all in our own little paradise. And uh, talk a little bit about the uh, players. Let's first talk about fire and, and in general about conflagrations and more specifically about city type conflagrations because we now, nowadays, we're familiar with all the wildfires that are burning down lots of buildings. But uh, at, at the um, early, you know, Late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, the United States and, of course, Hawaii, we were, everybody was experiencing a large number of citywide conflagrations, you know, destruction of large number of buildings, uh, diversity of ownership, fire spread across streets or yards, and, and, and typically uh, fire sizes that are beyond the capability of, of the fire service, and along with that with issues of water supply. Uh, here's a shot from Baltimore in 1904. Uh, I put that up there because I, I, I originally hailed from Maryland. And then uh, here's one from Boston, 1872, pretty, pretty widespread destruction there. Uh, you see uh, a list of conflagrations there. They, uh, of note, of course, the 1871 Great Chicago Fire, which uh, uh, we recently had Fire Prevention Week, which happens during uh, the week that fire occurred in Chicago. And the 1906 San Francisco Earthquake and Fire. Uh, 
also, I did put up one wildfire up there, 1871, the same day as the Great Chicago Fire, was the P Pestigo, Wisconsin fire, which was a wildfire that occurred in a, in basically a lumber town or, 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 or lumber camp. I mean, it was basically a town, and the significance of that fire, other than it occurred the same day as the Great Chicago Fire, and, and hence didn't really make the news, was uh, 1,100 persons uh, were killed in that fire because of a fast-moving wildfire that swept through the city. Uh, these these conflagrations, uh, these are com very common contributing factors, lots of combustible construction, wood shingle roofs, uh, the presence of high winds, uh, both, uh, you know, at the onset of the fire and, and as these conflagrations burn, uh, they create a condition that's, you know, that we, we call a firestorm, where the, the fire is uh, so large and de it's demanding so much oxygen that it's pulling oxygen into the fire, and this can create very, very high winds, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, hurricane force, and, and of course, naturally, that that's, uh, becomes a makes the fire spread even quicker. Inadequate fire protection water supply, lack of exposure protection, and we're talking about basically, you know, uh, distance uh, space between buildings as well as the uh, exterior of the buildings in terms of lack of maybe masonry walls, fire resistive walls, and, and openings in those walls that are not protected. And, and, and often is the case, the fire department is not equipped to handle fires on this scale. And, and that was the case in Honolulu. And of course, Here's the catch line, but there was one thing this fire did not have in common with other major urban conflagrations, and if you hadn't guessed, it was started by the fire department. And here you see the area where the fire was started, and we'll talk about that a little later, which is at the rear of Kalma Kapili Church. Key players. Uh, the key players all have a couple things in common. One, they're all dudes, and the other thing, they're all white. Well, I guess the third thing is they're all pretty powerful in the state of Hawaii at the time, too. Now, there were other key players, of course, the victims of Chinatown, Asian, uh, Chinese, Japanese, and, of course, uh, Hawaiian population in Chinatown. Uh, but the, these uh, were the folks that were making all the decisions uh, during, during the time of this uh, plague. Of course, we have the president of Hawaii, Republic of Hawaii, and his uh, very good friend, Lauren Thurston, who at the time uh, was also the uh, owner of the Pacific Commercial Advertiser, as well as uh, had a very many other business interests, including uh, he was a, par a partner in a hui that was basically set up the first streetcars in Honolulu. And then uh, at the onset of the plague, President Dole appointed a Board of Health, uh, putting in charge uh, the Attorney General Henry Cooper, and uh, it was actually a board of six folks. Uh, these are the three other folks that were pretty much uh, did all the the, the heavy lifting on in, in that committee, and and uh, eventually Dr. Clifford Wood there became the uh, the president of the Board of Health. Uh, other players. This is the uh, uh, Honolulu Fire Department. Around the time of the fire, I'm not sure if it was exactly before, the, the gentleman at the top center, that's Fire Chief Hunt. And he was a chief from uh, 1893 to, believe, 1901. So I'm not sure exactly when this photograph was taken, but it was, it was probably sometime in, in that time frame. And I'm not sure if these are all the folks that were at the fire, but, you know, I would imagine several of them were. And... Uh, What's cool about this fire is the way they brag about their chemical engine, which is coming out of Station 5, the Chinatown station, and, and uh, they're bragging that they can get this thing running quick. You know, uh, we, we used to have the term snooze, you lose. Uh, these guys say bed in, roll hitch time is 20, 28 seconds, and that, that's a big deal to get everything hooked up and out the door. So, that you know, that's, uh, that's them. And, of course, uh, the, the, basically the horsies or the horse-drawn apparatus, they – as I understand it, and again, this could be, I could be inaccurate, uh, and, and these photographs are taking, are probably from around 1910 or more, so they're not current to, to the, the, the plague fire, but, but they do represent the four major pieces of equipment available during this fire. At the, at the uh, upper left is engine one, a steam Steam engine, you know, they use steam to, to basically drive the pump to pressurize the water. At the lower left is engine two. Uh, upper right is what looks to me like a hose wagon. It's carrying a bunch of hose. And at the uh, lower right is the chemical engine. 
<clears throat> that's the, the one you just saw storming out of Station 5 in uh, Chinatown. And the chemical, uh, I'm not really clear on this, but as I understand it, they, they used like a loaded stream or soda acid type chemical like in the old fire extinguishers, uh, vinegar and sodium bicarbonate kind of thing to uh, project a loaded stream uh, fire. Let's talk a little bit about the plague, uh, bubonic plague, uh, you know, fleas on rats, infected fleas on rats. Uh, the, the plague context needs to be understood because there was what they call the third plague pandemic occurring uh, during this time, which is started in China in 1855. And it, it was basically a global bubonic plague. Uh, and, and everybody had great fear of it. And, and it, and moving into their town, especially, you know, port cities or, you know, especially port cities around Asia. Now, this is a photograph that um, Nicole Johnson from Kaufman found, and I didn't know what it was at first. And Nicole was, was, a, was a person that helped me with the presentation style of this PowerPoint, of which I thank her very much for that. So I, I kind of track down this photograph and if you don't know what these guys are doing they're dipping rats in a caustic or acid type solution to kill the fleas on them so uh, you know they, these, this is a serious job and I, I really like the guy standing there with the with the tongs like he's getting ready to go to a barbecue or something so so the plague did start entering the port areas, especially around Asia. Uh, you know, we can see starting there in China in 1882, and Hawaii. And you can see there's, you know, got to San Francisco in 1900, uh, and 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 even over to the UK. Uh, the plague uh, lasted for uh, several decades, and 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 uh, what I found by look reading into it a little bit. I think they were talking about over 30 million deaths occurred because of this plague. Okay. And so Honolulu was very concerned about it entering Hawaii and kept it out of there until late 1899. And then uh, here's a uh, story from the Pacific Commercial Advertiser, which I'll call the PCA. Uh, plague hits Honolulu and, and – a bookkeeper in the uh, Wingwo Thai General Store on Uwanu Street uh, died uh, and was diagnosed of dying of the plague. Uh, you also can might be able to see in his story that uh, there was a plague that occurred, a case that was uh, 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 identified on November 10th, but they kind of kept that quiet, you know. And but this one, because of the death, it, it had to get out. And here you see the the headline of the of the PCA, and uh, that's the way they did their headlines. They they didn't do banner headlines across the front page. Basically, the stories were all lined up in columns, and the center column had that had had the you know I guess the, the special spot, and that's basically the headline on the paper of that day. And uh, uh, you know, the black scourge may have originated among immigrants. It might have been brought here ashore from a slightly infected ship by rats, which I think is more likely. And it may have been hidden in Chinese or Japanese goods, more especially groceries, you know. So uh, the plague is here in Honolulu. Uh, pretty much immediately, they imposed a quarantine around Chinatown. Again, that death occurred on Nu'uanu Street. And, and uh, they basically... Uh, ran the quarantine zone uh, from uh, Queen up along Nu'uanu uh, Street to Kukui Street over to Nu'uanu Stream or River Street down down and back to essentially uh, Queen Street. There's a couple other streets there. I think like this is called, this was called Marin or something. And you'll note that, that Queen Street, at the time was basically the Harbor street in this area. Uh, and I guess, uh, Nimitz highway came in later, uh, to take care of that. Um, yeah. Okay. So we have the quarantine imposed, uh, uh, Hawaii state archive photo here of a, a rope line and standing in front of there is a, a national guard person. And we have them marching through the streets here, uh, enforcing the quarantine under, under bayonet basically. Uh, part of the quarantine actions also they de they designated a crematory where they burned infected items uh, you know 
and uh, I guess quite possibly remains. I'm not really sure. And uh, they also uh, designated a quarantine uh, island for folks that were infected were moved to, and of course that was Sand Island. Okay, so after a few days of quarantine on the 19th, uh, not much was going on, no, not a lot of cases, uh, no deaths. So they raised the quarantine on 12 o'clock on the 19th, you know, by order of Henry Cooper, Board of Health. And uh, the day after that, they established a sanitation commission uh, to, to basically do a study of Chinatown and, and find out what the heck is wrong with there. And one there, uh, the three folks that led that, uh, in the middle there, C.B. Ripley, an architect, and I believe he was an associate of uh, uh, of Dickey, uh, another famous uh, Hawaii architect. So I think they were actually partners or, or something like that. So uh, you can see there uh, a couple shots of uh, what it's supposed to be Chinatown area, and you see, you know, you know, rubbish uh, in in the in the alleys and and uh, mud and wet conditions, and not to mention quite a bit of uh, ramshackle combustible construction. And so, uh, a few days, you know, after the quarantine was lifted, uh, it was reimposed again because they had a couple more deaths. Uh, and I think one of these deaths, and this is just pure speculation, kind of scared them. And that was Ethel Johnson, a young lady from Evale. Uh, slightly outside the quarantine district and also a Caucasian. So the quarantine's clamped down again. And you can see uh, in the times uh, that things aren't totally politically correct there. And you often see references to Chinamen and Japs and those kind of things uh, in these newspapers. Uh, I guess uh, it's hard to be judged by, by current times uh, based on that. But what they, So once more to plague. The 29th, they got the uh, report from the Sanitation Commission, and the newspaper uh, published quite a bit of it. And the report had very descriptive language in it, you know, where fresh meat is exposed for sale in shops within a few feet of which are cesspools reeking with filth and vermin from which come clouds of flies. Doesn't it make your skin crawl? And, uh, of course, where kitchens are built next to foul-smelling privies, you know, and so... Uh, and lots of other language like that. They, they, the report contained quite a few uh, recommendations, things that would improve, uh, re you know, piping to remove, uh, you know, help remove uh, waste, uh, getting rid of cesspools, trying to, trying to provide drainage so it wasn't so wet in that area all the time, and, and, and get, trying to clean up some of the rubbish uh, uh, but, you know, they, when they had the fire uh, that destroyed Chinatown in 1886, I saw very similar recommendations in, in that after action uh, of the fire. And so I'm not sure uh, it, things were uh, followed on that particular day. But anyway, so now the Board of Health is meeting at the end of December, or at least at 1230, to decide what to do. And here uh, Lauren Thurston comes in at the request of Henry Cooper. And my guess is it was at the request of, of uh, President Dole. Uh, and he was there to suggest more vigorous action be taken to deal with this plague. And I'm not sure if they were not happy with what was going on at the time or what, but, but he was there to, to cheerlead them on to do the right thing. And um, here you see uh, on the right, there's, there's – their newspaper report of his presence at the meeting. At the same time, they're talking about already having burned three buildings. So that's kind of one of the things you kind of got to keep straight when you're reading these newspaper articles because things get reported uh, three or four days after they happen or maybe possibly the same day. So, uh, And Lauren Thurston basically uh, did some research. Uh, he, he, here he mentions uh, Oporto, which is now called Porto, Portugal, which is a port city, and how they dealt with it. And his research says basically fire and destruction of places are the best methods. So now we're talking about fire. And then his idea is that as soon as a building has a plague patient, uh, certain measures need to be taken to prevent spread. They remove the person, uh, take them to the place where they can be cared for, and then proceed to the work of destroying the building. Okay, and then over here, of course, all wooden buildings in which a case of plague occurs and all wooden buildings in the immediate communication therewith are to be burned. They made a decision to burn, and then uh, 
a day or two later, they meet again, and President Dole attends the meeting, and he says, hey, uh, uh, will we need to, ins- to destroy all of Chinatown? And the board's response was that, that it should be entirely wiped out. So, you know, at the onset of these controlled burns in early uh, January uh, 1900, January 1st, <clears throat> The decision had been made that you know Chinatown in the quarantine district at least was going to be basically raised, so that decision was made very early on. Uh, first controlled burn uh, was was December 31st, and it was there on Uwana Street. I'm guessing that's where the the first fatality uh, was uh, occurred. I have the word controlled in uh, in in um, highlighted there because. Uh, Anyone that's familiar with control burns needs the whole idea of control is you got to control it to the to the target and make sure that nothing else gets burned down. Well, uh, there was a uh, a masonry building behind um, the burn site that uh, stored a very very valuable lot of sake, and of course it says the upper story was used as a dwelling place by Japanese Yoshiwara woman, and I had to look that up and. Uh, and from as far as I could tell, Japanese Yoshiwara women were women that worked in the place w- which are kind of, I guess, equivalent to our modern day hostess bars. That's that's as far as I could get. I could be wrong about that. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, this was a building which the board desired to save, but within an hour, you know, after the fire started, the roof fell in, carrying part of the wall. So we have a big oops on the first control burn, uh, but uh, you know. It, 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 this is a learning experience. So burn number two, another incident occurred. And this, you see, uh, this burn was a small structure uh, just, you know, right by uh, at the corner of Mauna Kea and Pauahi. And you might not be able to see that, but right across the street, uh, uh, Mauna Kea Street is a little uh, a, a square there. And it's, it's denoted as engine house. That's the location of uh, station number five. Okay. Anyway, the fire chief was uh, injured in, in that fire. Um, uh, chief Hunt started through an alleyway on, on Mount Akea Street to go to the rear as he neared the end of the passageway. A burning porch, which protected from the burning, suddenly gave way, and a lot of blazing lumber was precipitated directly upon him, momentarily pinning him beneath the debris. But being the firefighter that he was, he struggled to get free. I guess he limped out to the fire because I think his uh, ankle was badly uh, injured and uh, managed to fire rest of the fire uh, fire ground operation from his uh, fire buggy. So uh, that was fire number two, and then in January four there was three more fires, and I just throw these up here. You know, it gets a little monotonous after a while, but they had a really nice uh, pick photo picture, photo illustration in the newspaper uh, showing the building that, that was planned to be built there on Keikau Alike Street, and that was on uh, January 4th. Uh, January 6th, uh, uh, another fire down here, but <clears throat> the Honolulu Ironworks, which I believe is where, uh, uh, where the crematory or the incinerator, which was acting as a crematory, was. And then uh, on the 11th, they burned a row of cottages along uh, Kukui Lane. And here we see the, uh, between the two hosemen, I believe that gentleman there with the portly figure that I believe that's Chief Hunt uh, basically managing the fire ground. Uh, okay, so now uh, January 12th, block 10. So we're, we're now progressing to where we got the confidence. We're going to burn a block this time. And uh, Unfortunately, they had an issue with this control burn because the uh, the new Japanese hotel right across the street, somewhere over in this area, uh, the fierce wind forced the flames into that building, and and where they were unable to save that structure. So another oops uh, on that one. But but I, I'm not so sure they really cared that much since the plan was to burn the whole t- place down anyway. But we'll see. So that was January 12th, block 10. And uh, well, here is here is a photograph of of uh, I think this is engine one uh, positioned on uh, Baratania right near Nuuanu and uh, uh, hooked up to the hydrant. And if you take a close look at these hydrants, we we have many of these around town that look exactly like this. I don't know if they're the same 
uh, vintage hydrant, but we still have those uh, dry barrel, big fat plugs uh, uh, around the home. So they may be they may be upwards of 120 years old. I don't know. But anyway, so, so they're basically uh, applying an exposure stream to kind. Of, I guess they're trying to tamp down a fire a little bit to keep it from uh, you know, keep it to block 10. And here's another block 10 photograph, probably before the fire. And you notice here, uh, a lot of people mistake this as, as the uh, uh, day of the, the big fire because it's got Kamal Kapili Church here in the background here, but it's not uh, during the day of that fire. This was block 10. This was all gone. And, and the interesting thing about this photograph is they, you know, the way they slant the utility poles away from the fire area so in hopes that they won't be damaged as they burn this block down. And uh, behind the uh, engine uh, operator, the pump operator here, is, is a, um, a burlap bag, and that's filled with coal, uh, as I understand it, which is used to, uh, you know, fire the engine. Okay, so after block 10, we're going to burn another block on the 16th, uh, block 9, and then on the 19th, block 11. Uh, this, I, I'm guessing, I'm not sure that this is a photo from the day of block 11 looking down towards the fire, and I believe this is down towards, uh, it's probably looking uh, from this area down, I'm not really sure. Uh, and uh, I just I like this photograph because it had Love's Bakery in there, which was a masonry building, which I, I imagine survived the, the fire. So and then of course, you have National Guard there walking the streets. Uh, OK, so we got rid of uh, block 11 or half of block 11. And so on the next day, January 20th. Was the plan burn of block 15. So. The, the hatch marks there on block 15, you note that, that that's how they designated on this map, that the place was insanitary because it was a site of uh, plague infection. And you also notice that block 10 is about 10 times the size of uh, block 15 is about 10 times the size of block 10. So th these guys are really getting aggressive and, and, the, and they further complicate their operation here because they need to protect that Kamakapili church, which is essentially surrounded on three three sides by block 10. So the, they it's slated to burn, and this, this newspaper article also indicated that the board is going to condemn the Boardman House and that that will be burned to the ground this the afternoon. And I only put that in. The Boardman House was the house of uh, where there was a fire death of another Caucasian, and that was actually over – way over on Ward Avenue. So they did do uh, several burns outside of the quarantine district, you know. Uh, okay, so day, day of the fire, the 9 a.m. start, uh, a fair trade wind, you know, was blowing. The plan was to start the fire at the rear of the church, in, you know, and, and kind of get it to burn back against the wind to help control it uh, up the Kukui. Kukio Street. Engine one was positioned in the key position here, you know, at Baratania and Mauna Kea Street. And other apparatus were probably uh, in position along, along Baratania, I'm not really sure, um, intending to maintain or establish water supply. Okay, so 9 a.m. start. Uh, this looks like it's very early in the fire. Uh, you see smoke coming from behind the church. And again, we're looking uh, from across Nu'uanu Stream, slightly uh, uh, Eva Malka of, of, of the church. Uh, uh, here it looks like the, the, something's getting involved, at least on that church steeple. And we move to these a couple photographs here. Uh, the one on the left, clearly you can see that the steeple is burning. Uh, now, they claim that the wind rose. Now, it didn't shift because it was always a trade wind. They claim that the wind rose, and that's how it got to the steeple. So I'll let you all be the judge of that because I, I can't tell if the wind is any higher here than it is here. So I'm thinking the wind was pretty stiff when they started, but that's just my opinion. And then the, and on the right, the inset is showing some, they're trying to basically apply some water to the, the fire, which is kind of 
they, they didn't they were intending to inst- destroy that building there where all the smoke's coming off the roof but not any not the church next to it and you can see that there's a couple streams operating there that are not quite uh, doing the job uh, you know because the steeple is very very tall and there are stories that a hoseman from from one of the engines actually uh, broke through the roof of the church and tried to uh, mount, climb the steeple with with a handheld uh, extinguisher uh, but to no avail but but uh, my understanding is he you know he got away okay uh, so again I the photograph I showed earlier shows if this fire has already destroyed the steeple it's probably uh, entering the church but these, these are the this is all the combustible construction that's behind uh, the church uh, just to give you an idea of that so Okay, back to the progression, and it just, the, the person that took these photographs is pretty amazing, you know. Uh, and and you see that the steeple is gone, the church is looks like it's starting to burn, and but but things are starting to happen a little bit downwind. Uh, definitely here, and this uh, right here is the hose tower or bell tower of Station Five, uh, of Station Five, just for reference, and and. Um, now we definitely the chirp the chirp is definitely going. Looks like the roof is gone. Uh, moving on down to Chinatown, uh, the first steeple has has been destroyed. And I'm not sure if the second steeple is involved or not, but fire is definitely going downwind. Both steeples are gone in this this picture, and you also see a crowd of people. Basically, I, I believe this is the um, I think there was a bridge at Baratania. Uh, uh, well, not well. They they were emptying from Baratania onto River Street here, and 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 uh, evacuating uh, from the uh, Eva side of the quarantine area. And I think eventually they moved up in here. And I believe there was a bridge at Kukui Street. <clears throat> More of and these people are progressing up to here. And the fight, it looks like you know, the fire is really ravaging uh, the district now. Uh, you see now the fire is burning back towards River Street, and the structures there right along River Street are starting to, to uh, combust. And there it looks like the wind is, is going pretty good. Uh, and that, you know, again, it could be that, 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 that mild firestorm effect that we talked about. Here's a view of the fire from Punch Bowl. Uh, you can see you know, the shadows of, of basically the remains of the church. You know, again, this fire started at nine o'clock, uh, uh, and it, the place was essentially wiped out by about two p.m. in the afternoon. And you see all the masted ships here in the uh, harbor down there. Uh, Oh, I just wanted to insert this picture, you know, uh, in May, uh, around May of 1899, this great new store opened in, in Honolulu, a city mill, and it was just what the doctor ordered because they, it was a hardware store that had all kind of lumber, and and it was, uh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot the name of the, of the Chinese owner, uh, just opened up a store, very proud of that. Uh, that store didn't make it. They, they were trying to protect it from the, from the, the quarantine control burns, but I believe, and I'm not really sure, I believe uh, the city mill uh, location was probably, it's somewhere in this area here, if you can see my cursor, I, you probably can't see my cursor, but anyway, uh, somewhere down uh, towards the harbor. It wasn't, it wasn't at the current location on North Nimitz, so, but the uh, city mill did not make it. So this is, this is kind of a, this is the, uh, the burned out Hulk of, of, of the uh, church, Kamakapili church. And this is station five right here. Okay. And it looks like another burned out Kamakapili. <laughs> another look uh, on the, from the, uh, across the new on the stream side. Again, the fire station is right here. Uh, more uh, destruction, uh, looking back up towards Punch Bowl. Pretty complete. Now, I'll just see some. This is a, a, an old photograph of Station Five. I believe that is a picture of a chemical engine. Not sure if it's the same one. And then here is the uh, Station Five when the host tower became engulfed, and and the remnants of Station Five. Uh, 
my understanding is this bunting here uh, was there to uh, memorialize the funeral of King David Kalakaua. Uh, another shot of the looking down uh, towards uh, from look, on Baratania, looking t uh, basically ever on Baratania. Okay, so the uh, evacuation of Chinatown, a little bit of panic because because initially, you know, the, the uh, National Guard were manning their posts and weren't letting people out, but I guess finally they were able to do that. And in addition to those folks you saw moving up uh, River Street towards Kukui, Kukui, Kukui Street, uh, I, every time I say that, we're going to have an issue with it. But anyway, uh, what they did was they directed uh, – the folks on the uh, Waikiki side of the quarantine district down uh, King Street. So this is a shot down King Street. Uh, this, uh, I believe, is right uh, the, the, in the foreground there where you see Castle and Cook. That, I think that's probably um, Smith Street at the time. And then where you see the Ho Stream all the way in the background, that's about Nu'uanu. Okay, and as you see, uh, refugees are coming up. Uh, the street there, and uh, the inset shows uh, what are purported to be shopkeepers uh, lining the street, and you see many of them are carrying axe handles, and apparently uh, their purpose was to keep uh, the refugees from uh, not uh, scurrying off King Street up into the up up into other areas, but to make sure that they were directed down King Street all the way to uh, Kauai Hau Church and where they were being collected uh, in the yard for uh, as a temporary staging uh, point. Okay. But you have to wear your straw hat, you know, to be in style these days with your axe handle. Okay. Uh, Again, I just put that in to show the evacuation out of the Eva side of the quarantine district. And uh, a couple of days later, uh, our map uh, shows the passing of Chinatown and basically outlines the extent of the complete burn of Chinatown and, and uh, the like. So uh, one of the casualties of the fire was Engine 1. Again, that was stationed, uh, positioned at uh, Mauna Kea and Pauahi. Uh, and like the true fighter fighter that engine was it stayed to the last possible moment to try to uh, do its job. Uh, of course, the horses had been uh, located in a safe area long before that. So there was really no way to get the engine out of there as fast as the fire was moving. Uh, the fire chief later said that they were, they, they were going to be able to restore that. Uh, they had somebody, a mechanic go up there and, and uh, it was reported in the newspaper that they were able to actually get the engine to turn over. So it was so, but I don't know if they ever, it was ever going to be super shiny again. I don't know. Uh, uh, so in the aftermath, 38 acre area, 11 full blocks, uh, at least 7,000, maybe seven to 10,000 homeless, direct damage of 2.5 million, which is a lot of money in those days. And the really big, News and, and 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 I guess good news is no fire deaths were reported as a result of this fire. So, uh, and in the aftermath, Chief Hunt uh, was published did, did a report. I'm not sure if he was reporting to some some uh, meeting or something, but he recommended more hydrants every 500 feet. He complained that they had to lay out more than a thousand feet of hose. Uh, in many instances, it went during the fires, and he wanted mains at least 15 inch in diameter. Where he talks about having to deal with eight inch mains and f with four inch connections. So, so that was one of the items he he spoke to, and uh, he also said very, some, very something very interesting about the cause, where he said the the actual cause was the waste of time in endeavoring to save the church but primarily the sudden rising of the wind, which carried the burning ember to the church steeple and out of reach of water. So, so uh, I guess they really were trying to uh, commit to the church, but I'm not sure uh, that waste of time really had a lot of impact on the fire. And of course, uh, during the fire, they, you know, there were crews working, uh, uh, downwind as the fire progressed. We, uh, there were some photographs of, of, of teams of, of folks uh, using rope lines to pull down buildings. There was reports in the newspaper of, of buildings being dynamited. 
so so they were trying to create some fire breaks, but I'm not sure. Obviously, it didn't have much uh, effect uh, on the fire. I think the reason why it you know it burnt to New Wanu Stream because there wasn't much on the on the other side of the stream to burn, and it stopped at New Wanu. I I think just the way the wind was, and 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 New Wanu appeared to be the point uh, where the the construction was. M more modern and a lot more uh, masonry construction. That, that that could be my guess. So this was a little sketch that was in in the paper on January 30th, showing a realignment of streets in Nuuanu to straighten, uh, I mean, in the quarantine zone to uh, straighten things out, and and um, I guess maybe dealing with the how Queen Street was going to be in the future. Uh, so they, they didn't waste much time in, in uh, going to work on this uh, Chinatown district. Uh, they did have a regulation put in place, uh, which I think was probably one of the first building regulations in terms of, 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 of uh, building safety from fire, a five feet minimum distance from property line. That's the only thing I really saw other than improvements to improvements to sanitation and improvements to uh, the firefighting water supply. Uh, uh, here's a table that kind of categorizes the total number of cases and total number of deaths and uh, has a has kind of an ethnic breakdown there. Uh, so this was a very, if you got the bubonic plague, chances are you were going to die because 61 persons out of the 71 died. And uh, 41 uh, of the plague cases occurred in the quarantine district. So, you know, not, you know, it wasn't like the plague was just totally restricted to that district. <clears throat> so, uh, and uh, fire was used at least 20 more times to fight against the plague. And I suppose because it did its job that they originally intended to get rid of all the quarantine district anyway, and they didn't have any fire deaths. So, so uh, why not uh, keep going? And so uh, the, I guess you can uh, ask the question, was it necessary? That's something that you can debate. Um, but, uh, and, and of course, uh, would it have been, would that decision have been made if it was Portlock, you know, or Kahala or whatever? I'm not sure where the cool areas were at the time, probably up in Makiki where all those big mansions are we have now. But uh, uh, that that remains to be seen. Uh, you know, some people uh, speculated that, you know, there was, you know, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese were really becoming organized uh, in business and a growing and prospering business. And that, that started to become a major source of competition. And so you can say, well, maybe, maybe that influenced decision, but again, uh, that's uh, all speculation. Uh, here is the uh, reconstructed Kalmukapili Church, and I can't remember uh, when it was. I said 1910. It was built, it was rebuilt in 1910 on King Street across from Tomashiro's Market. Uh, a famous local architect, Glenn Mason, told me that uh, the original church uh, it was uncommon because it had two steeples, and he later found some information out that King David Kalakaua ordered that church to have two steeples originally, uh, the original Kamakapili church. So I've always wondered why when they rebuilt Kamakapili church, they only put on one steeple. And of course, you know, it was probably a financial decision or because everybody else only had one steeple, but I liked the, I liked the uh, conspiracy theory that the, uh, they didn't build that steeple because the Waikiki steeple was the one that uh, started the fire. So that's pretty much it on the Chinatown second fire. But let's, I have a few slides and I have a, maybe a couple minutes. I'll run through these real quick. What about the first Chinatown fire? Well, it was bigger. It's, it distorted a, a much bigger area of Chinatown. It occurred on April 18th, 1886. Um, King David Kalakaua, very active. Uh, he was active in Engine Company 4 at the time. And purported to have been a nozzle man that was uh, partly responsible for saving Kamak, the first, that original 
during the fire, Kamakapili Church, from, from the blaze. And that fire was rumored to have started uh, when gamblers were hustling out of a place. Maybe they were being raided and they were trying to burn their betting slips. So that's one of the rumors of how that fire got started. Of course, they didn't gamble in Chinatown. The lower uh, left is, is a picture of, of uh, the, uh, one of the stations uh, with bunting and decorated uh, as a memorial to uh, the passing of King David Kalakau. And so here uh, on the right there is the church. Uh, it was being built in 1886. Construction started in 1881. It was actually completed in 1887. Uh, so it wasn't quite done during the fire, as far as I could tell from what I read. Uh, and uh, that that's the, the extent of the structure looking up towards the mountains. And you can see that uh, on the Waikiki side, a lot more area was burned than, than, than occurred in the second fire. And another look, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the angle is here, but then here, I, it's probably look again, looking a different mountain view. And that, that might be the next street over from New Uwana or something, I'm not really sure. And another look, uh, of the fire. So what else we got here? Uh, that's it. I'm thanking uh, EAH. And again, another thank to Nicole for helping me put together the look of this uh, presentation. And again, another thank you to Paul Fox. And I'm ready to take some questions if we have any time. Okay, anybody, any questions? Uh, throw them at Sam. Love your dogs. <clears throat> <laughs> I have one myself. Yeah, I only have two, so don't ask me where are the other ninety-nine. You know, <laughs> I get that about I get that about every other day when I take them walking. So, <laughs> hey, Sam, I do have a quick question. How was the money, or insurance company, or how did it finally get rebuilt? And the seven thousand folks that were homeless, what compensation were they treated to? You know, I really don't know. I, I, there were some articles about the uh, uh, related to the insurance claims that were made during the fire, uh, but honestly, I don't have a lot of information on that. Uh, I could probably dig up some of those articles, uh, uh, at least the, one of them where it talks about that. Maybe that has some helpful information in it. I know that you had a total figure of dollar value assigned to it. Yeah. So somebody. Yeah. Would yeah, and uh, you know, Chinatown was, as I, what I understand was, there were the the big land folks owned a good portion of that property, you know, uh, and it wasn't just Chinese ownership. So, the, you know, the big landed uh, estates, probably Bishop Estate, was in there. So, yeah, I'm sure they must have been insured. So, yeah, interesting. I don't, I don't know exactly. Did you, uh, Sam? Did you happen to think of? any of our current affairs and, and leadership styles that uh, we're using? <laughs> here? Yeah, the timing is right, right? I mean, it's just, in my view, uh, trying to put yourself in, in, their, in, in, in their shoes, it was, it was uh, you know, it was, they were faced with some very tough decisions. Again, you know, we're talking about a pandemic that ultimately killed 30 million people. Uh, there were, you know, like today, there's huge fear and, and uh, the need to do something, the need to take more vigorous action. You know, so, uh, you know, I, I, to me, uh, judging anybody in hindsight is a tough call, you know, unless you got a smoking gun somewhere, you know, but, but uh, definitely uh, the, the, um, the juxtaposition of of uh, Howley business interests and Chinese business interests, you know, that could be could have been a, a factor in the decision making. But you know, uh, what, what was your basis for coming up with that kind of anti-competitive? Uh, uh, was Dole involved in that? You had the, the president. There, there, there were there there have been some later arc articles, mostly published in. Um, there's a what's the Hawaii Historical Society published some articles and, and uh, they uh, 
they gave a little bit more of an Asian perspective. There was also a book uh, published by a public health expert out of uh, the West Coast called Plague and Fire, which focused on the plague and the decisions. And they definitely had uh, a view slanted towards, you know, you know that uh, – were, that the fires may not really have been necessary. That you know the quarantine uh, why was was basically racially based in those those kinds of uh, theories. You know. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Sam. From me, from my perspective, anybody else wants to use the reaction button and show an applause? That'd be great. <laughs> How do you do that in Zoom? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to see if I can find it here and, and put my thumbs up on it. <laughs> there we go. Well, again, thanks to EAH, uh, you know, and uh, uh, I, I I just enjoyed the opportunity. And uh, anytime Sam wants me to talk to you guys, that's fine, but as long as it's only once a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, you brought a great audience with you. Um, I don't, as I said, I don't know a lot of the folks there, but uh, it was nice to have this. Oh yeah, how many we got? How many did we get? Uh, a total of forty-three. I think it was up to forty-six at one point. Okay, yeah. Uh, 40, forty-seven actually. <clears throat> yeah. Forty-seven. Okay. <laughs> That's well, again, thank you all. So I'll I'll let you uh, close it out anytime you want, Sam. Okay, uh, Phil. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. Well, that, that'll end the formal part of the meeting, and um, if, hey, we like that dog picture. Yeah, that's Mackie when he was a pup. <laughs> he, looks, he was a big pup. <laughs> he looks clean and alert. Yeah, he, yeah. the wife takes real good care of him. <laughs> Martin, did you, uh, did you manage to get in? I see your name there, Mac. Do you have a joke for us? There's me. There's hey, Mark. Hey. Aloha, Sam. Maybe you can hey. share your humor with <laughs> us. Sam and I used to run the Navy together. Actually, I was prepared to bring humor to a thirsty uh, world. But I was, now that I'm settling down in my golden years and reflecting on the, my limitations, Okay, only got one sentence to go. <laughs> anyway, I've now understand more and more what Winston Churchill meant when he said, uh, "Don't worry about avoiding temptation. As you grow older, it will avoid you." That's the humor for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that was good. Okay, I think that's about it, uh, Phil. If you want to close it out. Well, that seems to be a good uh, capstone, a gravestone, <laughs> gravestone or capstone to this. <laughs> and good to see you, Mac. Aloha. Okay. Signing out.